creature is the shark. The shark is the best animal or creature in the water. Agreed? What is your Yeah, good question. A dead one. That's her favourite one. Um, anyway, I'm getting off topic. Alrighty. So, um, this morning, what I said to you is that the book of Jonah is a book about God's boundless compassion. It's about God's boundless compassion, unlimited compassion that should comfort us, but also confront us. And what we looked at is Jonah chapter 1, and what we saw is that God is a powerful God who we should fear and not flee from. He's a powerful God who we should fear like the sailors and not flee from like Jonah. I talked about how Jesus was the better Jonah, how he was more powerful and compassionate than Jonah. And I mentioned to you uh, that Jesus at the cross died selflessly for all people. And uh, my good friend George pointed out my pun here as well, in that Jonah sacrificed himself selfishly, um, like he was in the, about to get in the fish, and I thought that was pretty good. And so that was helpful uh, memory trigger for us. Um, today we're going to be looking at Jonah chapter 2, where Jonah is in the fish. Um, I'm going to call it a whale, you can call it whatever you want. And uh, the big idea we're going to learn today, or tonight, is that God is a saving God who we should praise and not be proud before. I'll repeat that later on, but why don't I begin with prayer? So please join with me. Uh, Father God, we are blown away by your mercy to us. Uh, we thank you so much that it's not by what we do, but what's been done at the cross that we are saved. Um, and that you love us by what Christ did. We thank you for your mercy to us and that salvation comes from you and you alone. And uh, Father, I pray as we come to your word right now that you may humble us, Lord, that you may teach us and that we may respond to you in praise um, for how great of a God you are. So, Lord, we love you. Please be with us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, so if you have your Bibles, keep them open at Jonah 2. I'll get there in a second. Uh, but before I do, I want to just tell you a story. A few years ago, um, my family and I went across to Europe uh, just for two weeks to visit my brother-in-law who was on student exchange. And we got to go to Italy and we got to go to Rome. Now, if you know me, and some of you guys know me now, you know that I love soccer and you know that I love coffee, right? So you're probably thinking, yeah, Rome's probably a good place for Joel. And I loved Rome. Uh, it was a great place. But what I wanted to visit or where I wanted to visit in Rome was um, a graveyard. Now, some of you are like, that's a bit weird. Like, why would you want to, you know, have a, bu- have a graveyard on your bucket list? Well, this graveyard was a very important historical graveyard, and it was called, let me tell you what it's called, San Callisto Catacombs. Now, catacombs are is pretty much an underground graveyard, okay? It's a bunch of a whole lot of tunnels underground uh, where people have been buried, and um, yeah, we went and visited the, these um, catacombs, which were quite famous in Italy. It's the oldest catacombs that are in Rome, and it's also the most famous because it had the most amount of dead people there. I think there was like 300,000 people were buried there in a 200-year period. But also, it had some of the oldest Christian paintings that are around in history. And so we went to these catacombs. They um, are just outside of the, the city of Rome, and it's basically on this farm. And so we went to this farm, and there's animals and sheep and everything. It was a really cool place. And then we saw this building, went to the building, paid our fare to see the catacombs, got a quick history lesson, and then we were guided down this really dark and narrow tunnel. And so we're walking down this tunnel, and it's very um, yeah, dark and a bit eerie. And then all of a sudden, this tunnel turns into the catacombs. And then all of a sudden, there's just cavities after cavities after cavities where dead bodies used to be. They removed the bones now for the, where the tourists walk past. And it was really eerie. And it was really, to be honest with you, it was quite confronting. In particular, because the majority of the cavities were really small ones because of the um, death rate for infants was quite high back then. And anyway, we're going through these catacombs. And then all of a sudden, we got to the tombs. Now, the tombs are where some of the Christian leaders of the day were buried, some of the early Christian martyrs. That's people that died for their faith in being Christians and were killed by Romans who didn't believe in Jesus. And in these tombs were some Christian paintings. Now, I don't know about you, but as I approach these tombs, I'm thinking, all right, what sort of paintings are they going to be? I'm guessing there's going to be a cross, there's going to be maybe a picture of Mary. Like, oh, I'm not too sure. But what I was shocked by was how there was no cross. There was no picture of Mary. Instead, there were some drawings of some bread and some fish and of some shepherds. And then there was a drawing of a whale or a big fish with a man inside his mouth. You see, the story of Jonah is the most popular story that was painted in these tombs. And this is some of the most 
oldest Christian artwork that we have. So I wonder why did they paint the story of Jonah? You know, they could have painted any other Old Testament story from Jesus, I mean, from God, you know, parting the Red Sea and other things, but instead they painted the story of Jonah. Why? Well, I think it's for a few reasons. I think firstly, because they understood that just like Jonah was in the whale for three days and then basically survived, so Christ was in the tomb for three days and survived and resurrected. And so these people who are in the tombs one day will resurrect. But I also think it's because they understood Jonah's words when Jonah said, salvation is from the Lord. Because that's a really key verse in this whole entire book. Salvation is from the Lord. Or I think as the NIV puts it, salvation comes from the Lord. I wonder if we understand what that means. Salvation comes from the Lord. What it means is that you are saved by grace alone, that you are saved by faith alone, that you are saved through the good news of what Christ did on the cross and not what you do. You are saved by good news and not good works. Like if I ask you right now to turn to the person next to you, and I won't, and I ask you to ask each other, how do you get to heaven? I wonder what your answer would be. Would it be you've got to do good works, you've got to be a good person, or would your answer be quite simply, it's through faith in what Christ did on the cross? I'm guessing maybe a lot of us here will answer that question correctly and say it is through Jesus and what he did, which is unreal, praise God. But I wonder as if you're in this room and you call yourself a Christian, I wonder if maybe you think that theoretically, but maybe, maybe practically in your life or emotionally, you don't necessarily show that. Maybe you're your heart lags behind your mind. Or maybe you're not a believer here tonight, you're still trying to figure it out, and maybe you need to come to understand that simple truth, that salvation comes from the Lord. Tonight, we're going to look at Jonah chapter 2. And like I said before, the big idea of this passage is that God is a saving God who we should praise and who we should not be proud before. Let me repeat that because it's the big idea of this text and of the sermon. God is a saving God who we should praise and not be proud before. So we're going to go through Jonah chapter 2, and just like Jonah chapter 1, I'm going to explain the story, and then I'm going to apply the story. I'm going to explain the story, and then I'm going to apply the story. So before I open up Jonah chapter 2 verse 1, let me just give you a bit of context, remind us of what happened this morning. Uh, what happened? We got introduced to a guy called Jonah. Uh, he's a prophet. He speaks God's words to God's people. God said to him, I want you to go to Nineveh and say it was that way. Jonah's like, sure, no worries. Went this way. He got on a boat. He went the opposite direction. He fled from God. He sinned against God. He rebelled against God. He got on a boat. God held a storm against the boat. There were some sailors in the storm. They desperately wanted to stop or survive the storm. So they did whatever they could to try and survive it. Eventually, they threw Jonah overboard. What we learned this morning is that God shows compassion to these sailors. And then what happened in verse 17? A great fish came and swallowed Jonah. And so what we see that not only does God show compassion to the desperate sailors, but he also shows compassion to a disobedient prophet. It's pretty unreal. God saves Jonah, despite how rebellious and sinful he is. God saves him. And so this chapter, chapter 2, is Jonah's prayer of thanksgiving. It's Jonah's response while he's in the whale to God saving him as he was drowning. So why don't we go through it and let me just explain a few things. In his prayer, in, in verse 2, Jonah says this, he said, In my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead, I cried for help, and you listened to my cry. You know, I wonder if you can imagine this. When the sailors threw Jonah overboard, right? The sailors, all of a sudden, they're on the boat, they're safe, the, the, the storm has calmed down, life's okay for them. But Jonah, he's in the waters, right? He's a Jew, he's not like us Aussies here, I'm guessing the majority of you who can swim. You know, we weren't afraid of the beach here today. Jonah would have been petrified. He would have been freaking out. So he's starting to drown. His clothes are getting really heavy from the water. He's starting to get really cold. His muscles are starting to get really tired as he's just trying to somehow float. He's trying to breathe in air, but all he's getting is water. He's drowning. He's down and he's depressed. And he continues on in verse 3. He says, You held me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas, and the current swirled around me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. You know what's interesting is in chapter two, chapter one, sorry, we see the sailors threw Jonah overboard. But here in chapter two, Jonah says, You God threw me overboard. Once again, we see here how God is sovereign, and even Jonah's recognizing this. God's in, in control of what's occurring. 
You know, God, for example, threw out the storm. God cast the lot on Jonah. God sent the whale. He's in control of the weathers as well as the whales. God is in control. Jonah goes on in verse 4. He says, I've been banished from your sight, yet I will look again towards your holy temple. You see, what happened is that Jonah most likely was in Jerusalem, right? That's where God's people are. That's where God's temple is. And then he fled as far away as he could from Nineveh on into the boat away from Jerusalem. And now he regrets that decision. You see, not only was he suffering physically when he's in this water drowning, he's suffering spiritually. He's regretting that he's not in God's presence anymore because he's fled from God and from God's people. Jonah's in agony. Once again, he continues to talk about his physical agony. In verse 5, he says, The engulfing waters threatened me, and the deep surrounded me. Seaweed wrapped around my head. To the roots of mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. Jonah is helpless and hopeless. After a while, he, he, he can't fight anymore, and he starts to sink underwater. As he starts to drown, he goes past seaweed and he just goes into the depths of the ocean. He is helpless and he is hopeless. Um, A few years ago, I went scuba diving with my dad and um, it was down at Jervis Bay and it was on this diving weekend and we were trying to uh, find this torpedo. We knew this was underwater torpedo, which is pretty cool, um, on the ocean floor. And so we knew it was in a certain direction and so we were swimming towards this direction and we are about 20 metres underwater. Um, but it was a current, so we had to swim like pretty strongly against the current. And so it was almost like going for a light jog. Like, you know how you need to breathe as you're going for a light jog to keep your oxygen supply up? And anyway, as I'm swimming towards this torpedo, all of a sudden my regulator, so that's the, um, basically the fancy name for the thing that you breathe air out of that goes from your tank to your mouth. Um, instead of giving me water, I mean, instead of giving me air, it started to give me water. So I'm underwater, I'm like... <laughs> It's like the water comes into my throat and then all of a sudden I'm starting to freak out because what I know is I'm 20 metres underwater. Now, that's a long way down. So it's going to take me a few minutes to get to the surface. I'm feeling hopeless, helpless and just desperate. Like, what what am I going to do? And all that's going through my head is I need air, I need air, I need air. Luckily, by God's grace for me, my dad was nearby, who I scuba dive with, and he was my diving um, buddy, and so it's by rule that you don't go too far from one another, and so I quickly swam to him, grabbed him and grabbed his emergency regulator, put it in my mouth so I could breathe fresh air again. Um, in those few split seconds, and I reckon it was only a few split seconds, let me tell you, that I was scared out of my mind, helpless, hopeless, and desperate. And I reckon Jonah was going through something really similar here. I think as Jonah's drowning, he is in just in desperate need of a deliverer, of someone to save him, just like the sailors were in the storm. Verse 6, Jonah tells us that God saves him. He says, But you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. And then in verse 7 to 9, he reflects upon God's salvation upon him. And so he says this, he says, When my life was ebbing away, falling away that is, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I'll make good. I will say salvation comes from the Lord. It's a really cool prayer. It's a, it's a really cool chapter. It's a beautiful prayer, and there's a lot of poetry in it. Um, as I was studying for this, there's a lot of um, parallels to the Psalms. So it seems like Jonah knows his Bible, and he's basically quoting Scripture as he's um, writing this prayer or saying this prayer to God. It's a beautiful prayer which talks about Jonah's desperate need for deliverance and how God saved him. And I, and I think as Christians, we can read this prayer, and we can almost say it like Jonah, and we can be thankful for our salvation, and that salvation comes from the Lord. It's an unreal prayer. But I wonder if it's incomplete. You see, Jonah in chapter 1, verse 1, or verse 3, sorry, he sinned against God. He fled from God's command. But you know what's interesting is in this chapter, in this prayer, he doesn't repent of his sin. Not once do I hear him say, I'm sorry, Lord, for fleeing from you. Not once do we see him being repentant. You see, this is a bit controversial and people debate this, but what I think we see in chapter 2 is some beautiful words, some true words, some amazing words, but also incomplete words. 
You see, I want to propose to you that in this chapter that Jonah's not being repentant. He doesn't have a humble heart, but instead he has a proud heart and he's just regretful. You see, this is a prayer of thanksgiving, but in reality it should be a prayer of confession, should it not? He just fled from God's command. And not only did he flee from God's command, he continued to flee against God and show no compassion to the sailors, even when a storm was in his presence. He was continuing fleeing against God. He doesn't have a humble heart, but he has a proud heart. And I think he has a religious heart. I'll explain that in a second. But let me just summarize to you what I think Jonah does in this chapter. You see, I think Jonah, he's thankful for God saving him, hands down, over the moon. Thank you, God, for delivering me. I think he's regretful for how he left God's presence, how he left God's people, how he left Jerusalem and the temple. I think he's regretful of that. But I just don't think he's repentant. Because you see, there's a difference between being regretful and repentant. Let me illustrate this. I want you to pretend that Will and Loretta are here, um, for some reason, are driving towards Will's parents, right? And let's say uh, they're going there for a family dinner or something, and they're in the car, and let's pretend they're on a highway somewhere, and it's just pouring rain, like absolutely pouring down rain, okay? And they're in the car, and for some reason, they're just being a little bit tense. And, and then for some reason, out of nowhere, Will is just like, Loretta, you're a gold digger. <laughs> Ooh. Right? Gold, yeah, yeah, all right. She gave me money. All right. Um, I want you to pretend that for a second, right? Now, I want you to pretend that Loretta, Loretta, sorry, in her right mind, just like slaps Will silly, right? Like just slams him and then kicks him out of the car into the pouring rain. Let's say it's hailing by now. Like it's just crazy out there. And then let's say she drives off. Now, I want you to pretend that she comes back 15 minutes later because she's like, oh, he's my husband. He's probably going to die. You know, I need to look after him. And, and then so she pulls over, gets ready for Will to get in the car. And then I want you to pretend that Will opens the door, gets in the car. He looks at Loretta. He's like, babe, I missed you so much. I just miss being your presence. You're just so beautiful. I just, I really, I really missed you. And, oh. I wonder if you can imagine that, and I wonder if you can imagine if he was saying, he wasn't being, and he's saying, I'm, he didn't ever say, I'm sorry for calling you a gold digger. But instead, he's just saying, thank you so much for saving me from the rain and from the hail. Thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. Like, in that moment, like, I reckon Loretta would have been a right mind just to slap him again and kick him back out. Like, he's not being repentant. He's not saying sorry for what caused the argument. Instead, he's just regretful of the consequences to his actions. You see, I think there's a difference between being repent, re repenting of your sin and just being regretful of your sin. You see, when you repent of your sin, you're sorry for your actions. Like, you, you genuinely think that your actions are wrong and you don't want to do them again. You know what you did is wrong, but when you're regretful, it's more you just regret the consequences of your actions. And you don't necessarily think what you did was that wrong. It doesn't necessarily really hit your heart that much. Look, I don't know about you, but I've seen this so many times over my life. I've seen guys who are maybe being caught for lying, or, or I haven't seen this, but maybe caught for adultery, but no matter what the sin is, and what you see is I'm always curious and trying to discern, is that person, have they repented of their sin, or do they just regret their sin and the consequences that occurred? Has it really hit their heart? Do they really hate their sin? You see, I think Jonah here just regrets his sin. He isn't repentant. You see, I think Jonah has got a religious heart. And I think that, number one, because like I said, he just regrets his sin. He's not repentant. But number two, because he compares himself to others. Look at verse 8. Jonah said, Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. Now, you might not pick up on this, but in chapter 1, who were the people who worshipped idols? The sailors. The sailors who ended up fearing God and sacrificing to God. So I wonder here if Jonah is comparing himself, he's comparing himself to people who worship idols, but it's almost like he's almost comparing himself to the sailors who we saw in chapter 1 were more godly than him. And I think it's a problem when you compare yourself to other people, especially when it comes to your standing before God. 
A few years ago, I did the city to surf with my brother, uh, and my brother's he's an older guy, he's not as tall as me, he's shorter, but he's a bigger guy, right? And so a few years ago, he weighed about 130 kilograms, so he's a big boy. Um, and so he challenged me, he said, Joel, I want you to go on the city to surf with me. And so I said, no worries, Evan, tell you what, I'll go with you and I'll go barely any training. Like, I'll just rock up and I'm sure I'll beat you. I was really confident, right? Um, anyway, he trained for the next six months, we got to the city to surf, uh, and we started running. Uh, I had trained for about two weeks. It was a mistake. But anyway, uh, five kilometers in, or four kilometers in, I was feeling pretty good. I was like, yep, this is all right. I'll keep going. It's a 14K run, by the way. Um, got to five kilometers. I'm like, oh, this hurts. Six kilometers. I'm like, no, nah, I'm done. And my brother overtakes me, just keeps on going. Super proud of him. He ended up beating me that day and did really well. Um, and he's continued to be running. And this day, he only weighs 90 kilos, which I'm really proud of him. Um, but on that day, it was really interesting because of how I compared myself to other people. And I wonder if you can relate to this. You see, um, as I was running those first four Ks and I was running past people, I was like, man, I'm so much better than you. Like, like seriously, like, I'm all over you. I'm like, yes, this is awesome. And I was just getting some pride, you know, like I'm a, I'm a good runner, like I've got this. I got it in the bag. And then all of a sudden, when I hit the six kilometer, the seven kilometer, I'm going up the hill, I'm struggling. And then all of a sudden there's like this old lady like running past me. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I hate you, I hate you. Oh, then all of a sudden I see this dude dressed as a banana, he's going past me. <laughs> and it's like, man. And then the worst thing was this, I think it was this like 11Ks, this dude ran past me and he was running with like a pram and like a kid. I'm like, no way, like that is so hard. That is so hard, let me tell you. So on that day, I was comparing myself so much with people and it led to one or two conclusions. Number one, I was better than them. Or number two, I just hated them. And so in other words, it led to pride or it led to despair in my heart. And, and that's what happens when we compare ourselves with people, right? Like, I, I think it's normal and human to some degree that we compare ourselves with other people. Like, as soon as I walk in this room or Brad walks in this room, you can be like, hey, he's white, he's different. Or as soon as I walk in the room more than Brad, you'd be like, he's tall. And for a lot of you, I'm taller than most of you here. And so I think there's normal comparisons. But I think comparison can get really dangerous really quickly. And we know this when it comes, for example, with looks. Or maybe, so maybe for girls, you might be thinking, is that girl prettier than me? Is, is that girl more attractive than me? Or maybe for guys, it's like, is that dude stronger than me? Is that guy more masculine than me? And we all know that I think is, when you compare yourself with other people, it can lead to pride or despair. It can get dangerous. And in particular, it gets dangerous when you compare yourself to other people when it comes to their relationship with God. They're standing with God. And I think as soon as you start to do that, you become religious. And that's what Jonah was doing here. He was comparing himself to people who worship worthless idols. And if I'm honest with you, I feel like it reminds me of another story in the Bible, a parable that Jesus talked about. I can't remember whereabouts in the gospel, but basically the story is, is Jesus talks about how two men approach the temple to pray. One man was a Pharisee, so he's like a religious dude, teaches the law, a godly man, so to speak, or claims to be. Another man was a tax collector. So he steals money, he's the filth of all filth. People just did not like tax collectors. And what we're told in this story is that the Pharisee approached the temple, prayed to God and said, God, I thank you that I'm not like this tax collector. I thank you that I'm a righteous man, that I pray to you, that I give money to you. Whereas the tax collector approached God on his knees beat his chest and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And what Jesus tells us is that the tax collector left as a righteous man. I find that really interesting. You see, the Bible talks about religion and it talks about it in one or two ways. It talks about it in a good way and a bad way. In James, it talks about that religion is a good thing where you care for the widow and the orphan and you use your words correctly and lovingly. But then the Bible also talks about religion in a bad way. Like that Pharisee, or like the Pharisees or Sadducees throughout the New Testament. Guys who claim to love God with their heart and mind and soul, but really they're far from God. Jesus called them whitewashed tombs. That's literally whitewashed tombs that looks good on the outside, but on the inside is filthy, rotten and dead. You see, the Bible talks about religion in a good and a bad way, and Jonah is religious in a bad way. He doesn't have compassion for orphans or widows. He doesn't have compassion for anyone. He's a jerk. He's a religious guy who thinks he's better than others. And he's not repentant. And what do we see in verse 10? Well, we saw this whale, this great fish, vomited Jonah up onto the land. 
Now, this could be a coincidence, but I, I reckon it's maybe more than this. I honestly reckon that it's almost like the whale and God himself was just disgusted at God's heart. That literally, the whale is just like, like, he's, like, Jonah's just full of baloney. Like, he's just, he's all talk and no walk. Like, once again, just like in chapter one, where he's like, I'm a Hebrew, I worship the Lord. But he didn't worship the Lord. Here, I think he, I'm sure he's grateful for his salvation, but I just don't think he's repentant. So how do we apply this to us? How do we apply this to us? Well, two questions. Number one, are we religious like Jonah? Are we religious like Jonah? Are we religious in the sense that we don't understand that salvation is by good news and not by good works? I think the longer you're a Christian, the easier it is to become more religious. And what I mean by that is I think the longer you are a Christian, the, the easier it is to, to See, when you first become a Christian, you, you follow Jesus and his commands. But I think the longer you're a Christian, you just start to only follow his commands as your heart gets hardened towards actually following Christ for who he is. And you know what's difficult about religious people, and the bad religious kind that is, is they go to church. They, they look like they've got it all together. But the reality is their heart's far from God. And so let me ask you and me, are we religious like Jonah? And I've got three questions that helps us diagnose whether or not our hearts are, th- are like this. And the first question is, do we find it hard to repent of sin? Like Jonah, do we find it hard to say sorry of our sin to God and also to other people? Is there sin in our life where we just haven't given over to God? Or we just don't want to give over to God? That that part of our life, we've just shut off and said, God, no, you don't have that control in my life. That's the first question. Do we find it hard to repent like Jonah? Number two, are we unauthentic? Are we someone that when people ask us, how are you going? We're like, yeah, I'm good. When really you're dying on the inside? Like, are we unauthentic thinking that we need to put on this mask, we need to put on this persona that we are really happy people, good people, righteous people, faithful people? Number three, do we frequently compare ourselves to other, sin- other people and their sins? I'm going to get a bit, like, I'm going to joke here for a little bit, but, like, I wonder at times if we think, you know, I'm, I'm actually like a pretty good person. Like, I'm not that bad of a person compared to a dude who's raped someone or some dude in jail. Like, I'm a pretty good guy. Like, I don't know about you guys, but sometimes, you know, I can think I'm a good guy compared to other people. I'm, like, compared to Will, especially this Will, I'm a, I'm a pretty good guy. Like, you know, he's a, he probably thinks the same. No, I'm just joking. But, like, I wonder if we do that. Do we compare our sins or what we're going through and justify them by comparing it to other people? instead of understanding that we are all sinful and saved by grace. You know, what's interesting is that religion just robs you of joy. You see, I think part of us thinks that if we humble ourselves and we repent of our sin and confess our sin to other people, then that will lead to pain, when the reality is it leads to joy. I think some of us think if I just protect myself and, and, and not be authentic with people, then that will be what's best for me. Not understanding that when you pretend, it actually doesn't help you at all. It damages you as you can't be, get help from other people, from God's people to love you, support you and pray for you. And then number three, we think if we compare ourselves to others, then they'll make us feel good about ourselves. But the reality is it leads to despair, like I said before, or pride. And it doesn't help us at all. So are we religious like Jonah? Are we religious like Jonah? Because you see, I think we need to understand our great sin before we can see our great saviour. Number two though, are we thankful like Jonah? Jonah was a religious guy, but he also was thankful for God for his salvation. He genuinely was in this case. So I wonder if we are thankful for God and how he shows mercy to us in our lives. You see, this is really important. Before we can understand and rejoice over the good news of the gospel, I think we need to come to understand the bad news that makes the good news so good. And so let me ask you, are you thankful for your salvation? And if you're not, I want to suggest you two things that will help you be more thankful towards God. Number one, it's understanding the bad news that makes the good news so good. It's understanding your sin and the destruction that we were on without our Saviour. And number two, it's understanding our Saviour Jesus and who He is, what He has done. We are to be students of our sin, but also our Saviour. And when we are, it will help us to be thankful towards our God. Number one, we need to be students of our sin and understand the destruction that occurs when we sin. 
Um, a few years ago, my wife and I, I feel like I'm just telling you where we traveled. We haven't gone that far, I'm sorry. Uh, but a few years ago, we, we went to uh, America for a short holiday and uh, we went to um, Las Vegas, right? And we went to Las Vegas, flew in um, just so we could go to the Grand Canyon, which is um, about a five hour drive from Las Vegas or to the Arizona side. And so anyway, we got into Las Vegas like 5 a.m. in the morning. Um, I got a long black coffee, got in a car. And in America, they drive on the opposite side of the road, if you didn't know that. Uh, and anyway, we drove five hours, got to the Grand Canyon. Grand Canyon was amazing, blew my mind. Got back in the car, drove five hours back to Las Vegas. And the whole time I was driving, it was pretty easy. We're on a highway, I'm not on the wrong, you know, I'm not on the wrong side of the road. Everything's pretty safe and fun. But then all of a sudden I came to Las Vegas at about 11 o'clock at night, came to the first intersection. I'm really tired, just ready for bed, and the light goes green. I turn, and then I keep driving in this lane for a little bit, but I'm just not really concentrating. I don't know if I was looking down or around. And then all of a sudden my wife, Emma, is just like, Joel, you're on the wrong side of the road. Move, like turn, do something. She's just yelling at me, screaming at me for a response because I was on the wrong side of the road. These was four lane roads, right? And I'm in the wrong side of the road. I look up and all of a sudden I just see headlights coming towards me. So what do I do? Listen to my wife, as you should. Um, moved over, went over this little medium. Hopefully, the, luckily there's no cars on the other side of the road. Got onto the right side of the road, just pulled into a driveway, turned the car off, my heart's just racing. And then I just turned to my wife and I just said, oh, babe, thank you so much. I don't know what was going on, I just wasn't thinking. Honestly, I didn't even know that I was on the wrong side of the road. Now, why do I say that? If for us to be thankful for our Saviour, it's important for us to understand our sin and how we are headed for destruction or were before he saved us. And just like the reason why I was so thankful to my wife that night is because you know and I know what was going to occur. If I didn't know what was going to happen, there was going to be just death and destruction. And so that made what my wife did, the good news that she told me of move, so much better. And so it is of our sin. As we read God's scriptures, we should resonate with people who are sinful. We should not think that we're the heroes in the Bible, but instead we're the sinners. And so as we read God's scriptures, let's try to understand who we are. You see, there's three ways we can understand our sin. Number one, by reading God's word. Number two, by looking at God's world. And number three, by looking at our own hearts. As we read the scriptures, we'll see in Romans, for example, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That we sin by our words, our thoughts and our deeds. That we sin by um, not doing what uh, we shouldn't do and then by not doing what we should do. As we learn about our hearts and how depraved we are. As we learn about our own hearts individually. As we look to the world, we shouldn't shut ourselves off from the news and from hearing about terrible things that are occurring all around the world. But instead, we, our hearts should grieve over such things as we are reminded of the sinfulness of humanity. And then we should look at our own hearts. You know, I, at the end of the day, I'm a guest here. I don't know you guys. You know your own hearts. You know that the sins that God's convicting you of. You know what God wants you to repent of and trust in Him. We need to study our own hearts to understand our sin. But then number two, we need to understand who our Saviour is, who saves us by grace. Um, tomorrow, if I went home, and if I saw my wife, Emma, who some of you met today, and, and I went to her, and I'm like, babe, I missed you so much. Like, the church camp was great, but I just, I really missed your blonde hair and your brown eyes. Far out, you're beautiful. Now, some of you are like, what's wrong with that? But some of you here who met my wife will know that she doesn't have blonde hair. She's got brown hair. She doesn't have brown eyes. She's got blue eyes. And so you'd see there'd be a problem there, right? And so it is with us. It's just like Jonah, who's like, salvation's from the Lord. And he didn't really know what that means. May we understand who Jesus is as we praise him. May we study who he is. Earlier it was read to us, Matthew 12, um, where Jesus talks about this. Let me read it out to you again, because this helps us teach us more about Jesus and how he's a better Jonah. Jesus said this in verse 38 of Matthew 12. He said, A wicked and adulterous generation asked for a sign, but none would be given except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the huge fish, so the Son of Man would be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will stand up in judgment at this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now someone greater than Jonah is here. You know what's really interesting about Jonah is Jesus doesn't talk about Jonah like he was a good guy, he was a man of faith, he did good things. 
No, 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 no. What Jesus talks about with Jonah is he survived being in a fish for three days. Like, okay, that might be impressive. I'm not too sure. Like, that'd be impressive for my wife, considering how much she hates fish. But I think for most of us here, like, we could do that, right? Like, you know, we'd be hungry, we'd be stinky, starving, thirsty. But I reckon we could do that, right? So Jonah survived a fish for a few days. But Jesus survived death. He resurrected three days later. You see, that's pretty cool when you think about it. This story of Jonah in chapter 2, where Jonah's in this watery grave. He looks like he's dead, and then God miraculously saves him. So Christ Jesus, he died at the cross, and there was in a tomb for three days. It looked like he was dead, and then miraculously he resurrected. As we read God's scriptures, we can see allusions, we can see points, typology, things that point to Christ. And as we study God's word, we get to see our Savior and how great he is. Are we religious like Jonah? And are we thankful like Jonah? Our God is a saving God who we should praise and not be proud before. Maybe tonight God wants you to think and consider if there's any sin in your life. Maybe you're not being humble before him or maybe you haven't been praising him. So my challenge to you and to me is that we may study our sin and that we may also study our saviour who saves it from it. Let me pray to close. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much uh, for your compassion upon us. Our salvation is through you. How you save us despite the fact that we are sinful. It's not by what we do or by our faith, but instead it's by your grace. And so we thank you. But Lord, at the same time that you save us, you ask us to respond to you in faith. And so Lord, I pray for all of us here tonight that we may have faith in Christ and what he did on the cross. And that we may also not only respond in faith, but also praise, humble praise, thanking you for how great you are. Help us not to compare ourselves to other people. Help us not to be unauthentic and help us to be repentant of our sin. We love you and we praise in Jesus' name. Amen.